G'day and welcome back to the Drone News for the 15th, 16th of January 2025 and we've got a lot to talk about, a lot of DJI stuff. One thing in particular changes everything. This is a game changer from DJI and uh, we'll get into that in detail. Also got a new drone from DJI, the DJI Flip and some other DJI stuff as well as looking at rules and regulations especially in the wake of the Palisades drone incident where it's alleged that a mini drone crashed into the wing of a super scoop of um, firefighting plane causing damages. Will that cause changes to regulations? And also I want to talk about risk and what is a bigger risk than recreational model aircraft and drones? Well I'll tell you and it's something I've told you before. Finally we've got a drone that's been given an exemption from remote ID which further proves remote ID <laughs> just a joke. Anyway let's go back to the edit desk and I'll tell you about all the stuff in detail. So let's take a look at the drone news for the 16th of January 2025, probably the 15th maybe where you're living. It's pretty much DJI focused this drone news. DJI have made all the headlines pretty much. First of all, geofencing. Geofencing. Now this has been something that I have complained about with DJI drones ever since it was introduced. It's basically DJI saying you can only fly where we let you fly. Now you may have paid hundreds or thousands of dollars for your drone from DJI but ultimately you don't own it or at least you didn't until I think it was the 13th of January uh, this year DJI announced that they've removed the geofencing limits on drones in the USA. So now you finally own your own drone. You get to say when, where and if you fly. Now this was a, a, a change made in Europe a few, quite a few months ago and despite concerns there hasn't been an overwhelming flurry of people doing bad things with drones and I expect the same will be true in the USA. Ultimately geofencing was a nice to have but it wasn't always particularly effective. We only have to look at the recent Palisades incident where a, a little mini drone allegedly crashed into a super scooper firefighting aircraft putting a hole in the wing. That was in a no-fly zone and geofencing was active at the time but it still happened. So geofencing it was a feel-good but not necessarily an effective way to stop people from doing bad things. So remember people who are intent on doing bad things will find ways to do it anyway. So that's something you should be remembered at all times. So geofencing gone. That means that the video I did on the little DJI Neo recently uh, I may have to go back and revisit that because I said it's a great drone. It's got great features and functions. The problem is, well there's two problems. First of all you have to activate the damn thing which I'm still not happy with and secondly you didn't own it, DJI owned it because they could stop you flying where they didn't think you should be doing so. And of course this goes back many years because I used to fly at an airport, at an actual airport where according to DJI I wasn't allowed but I was allowed. I had all the necessary documentation certification but unless I wanted to jump through hoops DJI forbid me to fly my drone at that airport despite the legalities of it. So I've never been a fan of geofencing and now that it's gone in the USA hopefully it will also be gone in New Zealand. I haven't checked on that yet but hopefully that will be the case. Next thing of course is DJI Flip. It's a new drone from DJI. Knock me down with a feather. It's been leaked for so long but finally now that it's been launched we get to see what it's all about and I'll tell you what it's all about. Uh, and more importantly I'll tell you why they launched the Neo. This is interesting because if DJI had bought out the Flip with all its autonomous features and everything at the price point where it exists and that's like 400 and something dollars US, it's 800 and something dollars New Zealand. If they'd bought that out before the Neo then people would have probably thought hmm yeah mm, autonomous features I'm not sure I don't want to necessarily risk that much money on something that may not work as advertised. So what, what DJI did is they launched the Neo. It probably was a lost leader. They probably didn't make money on the Neo. They launched the Neo at a, at a real throwaway price. So people thought ah, what the hell buy one try it out. They bought one they tried it out they said wow this is amazing it follows me it'll, it'll do all these droney shots and spotlights and all this fancy autonomous stuff. I don't even need to use a, a radio controller or a smartphone and I can still use this little drone to get some really cool shots. So they, they basically proved the technology to the market through something that people could afford to take a risk on. But they were very clever because they left out a good camera. They put in a pretty crap camera to be honest. So people were all saying this Neo is fantastic but the camera sucks and DJI knew this. So they overcome any resistance or any objections that people might have to unproven technology. Once everyone was happy with the technology they then said here's the flip and it's got a really good camera with a 
three axis gimbal. Well, I think it's three axis or two axis, whatever. Um, so now people who bought the Neo are going, oh no, I want this functionality, but I want the better camera. I have to go and buy myself a flip. And of course, that's where DJI makes the money, because if you think about it, the flip is a Neo repackaged. So the electronics are all basically identical. Um, it's just repackaged with slightly bigger plastic, slightly bigger motors, and a slightly different battery. So it costs twice as much to buy it, but it certainly doesn't cost twice as much to make it. So obviously the, the profit margin on the flip will compensate for maybe the, even the loss of money they made on the Neo, and everyone, all the, all the bean counters will be rubbing their hands going, woo, because people will buy the flip in droves. Will I buy a flip? No, I won't, because the value equation isn't there. In New Zealand, it's about 800 and something dollars, uh, which is more than I want to spend on a drone for that sort of activity. If I wanted a camera drone, I'd go for the Mini, because it's got it, it's better wind resistance, it's, it's just an all-around better craft, that sort of thing. And if I wanted, I've got an autonomous drone, I bought the Neo with my own hard-earned money, and the camera on that is not the best, but it's good enough for what I want to do. It's, it's never going to be a cinema camera, but I can make it look fairly good. You've probably seen some of my Neo footage, and it doesn't look too bad. If you spend a bit of time while you're editing, you can tidy it up, tart it up a little bit. It looks okay, and that's all you need. Remember, good enough is good enough. Now, the next piece of DJI news is Flycart and Agris. Here in New Zealand, DJ, oh, sorry, the Civil Aviation Authority have issued a directive to check your big DJI drone because there could be some problems with the arms. Now, I haven't heard about this anywhere else in the world. Maybe it's just a one-off, but you know how regulators are. You've got to be super cautious because these are big drones. Fall on your head, they'll kill you. So they've required people to do a check, and I don't know if you've got one of these drones, which I don't think you probably have, but you might want to have a look and check. Just make sure. Going back to the Neo for a moment, there's a number of people who've reported flyaway issues. So suddenly the DJI Neo just goes away, buggers off, disappears, flies off at a great speed and a random tangent and <laughs> never to be seen again. If this was a one-off, you could understand, yeah, sometimes bad things happen, but it seems to be quite consistent. Quite a few people have had this problem. It seems to arise in one of two ways. Either the drone bumps into something, or there's a really big gust of wind, which seems to upset the IMU, the, the gyros and the accelerometers, and then the, the drone just basically doesn't know where it's at, so it decides to go somewhere else at random, and off it goes. Or one of the precursors to this seems to be a sudden loss of satellites. Just for a moment, just for a moment, the satellite count drops to zero, then comes back up again, and then the drone seems to be lost. It seems to think it's in some foreign land that's going to go back to where it was, which means it buggers off in some random distance. In some cases, even with the radio control transmitter, you have no control or so little control over the drone, you can't recover. Some people have discovered that if they're recording when this happens and they turn off the record function, the drone recovers its sensors. So maybe it is that simply the processor on board is overloaded. It's, and that could be, you know, if it has a, a big IMU um, bump, maybe the amount of processing involved in dealing with the massive changes in attitude and yaw and pitch um, overloads the processor. Maybe with the loss of satellites that causes an overload. We don't know. There's no, and DJI have said nothing. Um, they've said, oh, if you de if you if you if your Neo flies away and you've got the you know what is it the DJI Care, just send in your flight logs and we'll send you a new one. The problem is if you're flying the DJI Neo autonomously, you don't have any flight logs. They're on the drone and it's gone. <laughs> but I had this almost happen with mine. I was, was direction follow. It was perfectly fine. It was doing its job. And a sudden gust of wind came along on a hot day. It tipped it up probably you know maybe 45, 50 degrees. And then it got really unstable and it was starting to dart all over the place. I actually had to run after it and grab it out of the sky or it would have, I'm pretty sure it pretty, would have buggered off, would have gone away. I'd never have seen it again. So I expect that at some stage I will lose my Neo. If this is a problem, it exists. Maybe they'll fix it in a firmware update because remember, all new DJI products have problems. We had the Avata with the, you know, the, the flip of death and we've had all sorts of issues. Hopefully they will identify this and fix it or maybe they'll just say, mm, just upgrade to the flip. Not a problem, but if it's the same software in the flip as it is in the Neo, will the flips fly away? It's too early to tell. They've only just come out. We'll have to wait and see what happens there. Right, and uh, going back to CAA New Zealand for a moment, I um, I emailed them because I did a video on the rules in New Zealand. Got a lot of views, a lot of comments, a lot of people concerned, a lot of people um, you know voicing their opinions and asking questions. And I thought, well, I'll get CAA on the line and I'll ask them some questions, ask what people have asked, and discuss this whole where the rules are going. And so I sent them a nice polite request for a um, an interview to be put on my YouTube channel, and sadly they declined. 
um, it seems that they believe that if, they, if I interview them, I may have an unreasonably large effect on the drafting of new regulations and it's unfair for one person to have more influence than others. I don't know how that works. It sounds like an, it sounds like an excuse to me. It sounds like a, we're too scared, so we're going to come up with an excuse so that we don't have to talk to you because it could be embarrassing. I don't know. Um, well, I gave them the opportunity to have their say. They've chosen not to exercise that opportunity. Fair enough, that's up to them. And the reason that I want to do this also was that here in New Zealand, around New Year's Eve, or it's on New Year's Eve, so footage was posted to the internet, taken by somebody with a drone who, who flew their drone up to get some sort of aerial shots of fireworks that are released from one of our buildings in our largest city, the Sky Tower. It's very impressive, lovely fireworks everywhere. Now this was uh, reported to CAA by multiple Karens who said this must be illegal, they're flying a drone at night over property without permission, um, potentially over people, and within four kilometres of a helipad. Oh my god, where did they bury the bodies? So CAA have said they were investigating and looking at previous cases, the, the person that did this could if almost possibly be up for as much as $3,000 in fines because they flew a drone at night. They flew a drone over property without the permission of the property owner. They flew within four kilometres of a helipad and they may or may not have flown over people to do so. Now, each of those is an offence in our regulations. The interesting thing is that if this was Canada, if this flight had been conducted in Canada, exactly the same flight, it would have been totally legal if with a sub 250 gram drone like a DJI Mini. Totally legal. Nothing wrong with it. If it had been done in the UK with a sub 250 gram drone, totally legal. Here's, a, here's some footage taken. And you look at this, this is London. You can see this person is flying in a built up area at night, um, within almost certainly within four kilometers of a helipad, um, over people, over property, but this is 100% legal. But in New Zealand, 3, 000, perhaps a $3,000 fine. I think that speaks to the fact that the rules in New Zealand are woefully out of date. Every drone, no matter how small, is treated as if it weighs 15 kilograms and could kill people with the blink of an eye. So that's why I wanted to interview with CAA. I wanted to please explain and tell us whether you're actually enforcing these rules. It looks like they are because they're investigating this flight at New Year's Eve. It's just it's an unreasonable burden on the people of New Zealand that their regulator is a decade out of date with the rules and people will suffer accordingly. People doing things that are completely safe, deemed to be completely safe in other countries, face severe penalties if they do so in New Zealand. CAA has said on many occasions, when it comes to regulation, we are a fast follower. <laughs> What's fast in terms of aviation? 10 years? I think 10 years is not fast, but there we are, that's where we're at. Now, finally, in light of the incident in the Palisades, where it is alleged that a DJI mini drone collided with a super scoop of firefighting aircraft, um, I have had a lot of emails and there's been a lot of comments saying this can't be good for the hobby. There's going to be more regulation. We're going to be, you know, more restricted and, and who knows what's going to happen. Well, my response is I don't think that would be right because, as I've said many, many times, it's not drones that are the risk, a bigger risk to people. It is falling space junk. Falling, bits of stuff falling from space poses a bigger risk of damaging property and injuring people than the flying of recreational drones. And there was more evidence this week to support my claim. Uh, a family in the UK was sitting inside, heard a loud noise, went outside and found the windscreen of their car had been shattered by a piece of sport, falling space rock. Yep, bang, out of the blue, smack, broke the windscreen. Um, and of course this comes on top of uh, Mr. Otega in Florida who had a piece of the space, uh, International Space Station fall through his roof and if he'd gotten in the way of it, it would have killed him. Uh, we've had hiking trails in the US have had pieces of SpaceX rocket land on them. If there'd been people hiking in that spot at the time, people could have died. And in Tunguska in 2013, over a thousand people were hospitalized when a meteor, a piece of space rock, blew up over the city, shattered windows. Lots of people had laceration injuries from broken glass, had to be taken to hospital and treated. So the risk from falling space junk is much greater than the risk from recreational multi-rotor drones. Now we don't have any regulations designed to protect us from falling space junk, even though it's the bigger risk. We're not told you must wear a hard hat if you go outside because falling space junk. You could get hit on the head and badly injured. Well they don't tell us that because if we suggested that they'd say don't be silly, the risk is so low it doesn't merit thinking about. It doesn't merit any kind of action on our part because the risk is so low. But we've already just proven that it's a bigger risk than the risk associated with recreational multi-rotor drones. So why do we have all these regulations 
for a risk that is smaller than the risk of falling space junk. This makes zero sense to me. <laughs> Either something is risky enough to be regulated, to have regulations in place such as hard hats, or it's not. But there we go. So if the, any of the regulators decide, ooh, drone hit plane must increase regulations, I will have them on a plate. Because also, the person, fly, person or persons flying that drone in the Palisades, they were flying in breach of regulations. They weren't supposed to be flying. So any moron who might be working for a regulator and decides, ooh, yeah, people aren't following the rules, we need to make more rules, doesn't quite understand the nature of the problem. More rules will not affect people who choose not to follow rules. It only affects the responsible law-abiding people. So in effect, you are saying, this person's done a bad thing, let's punish the innocent people for his deeds. The people that have been responsible and safe, let's punish them because this person over here who is irresponsible and broke the rules, you know, did something bad. No. <laughs> There'll be a red card for regulators that try that one on, I'll tell you now. Um, now finally, remote ID. We had the whole situation on multiple occasions now. News Uzi, New York drones, remote ID should have solved that problem, wasn't even mentioned. We had the uh, drone flights in the LA and the Palisades area, illegal unauthorized drone flights. Remote ID should have solved that problem. It obviously didn't. Remote ID is a bust. And I think further proof of that is that the Red Cut Holdings, the company that makes drones in the USA, they've been granted special dispensation to make drones that don't have remote ID. Yep. They can make for, for research purposes and other purposes, they can sell drones without remote ID, even though everybody else making store-bought drones has to have remote ID fitted. Red Cat, nah, don't have to, because I think everybody knows it is just a joke. It's an unfair, unreasonable burden on responsible, law-abiding drone and RC model flyers that they have to buy these modules and stick them on their gear when it does nothing. It's not even used. As far as I'm aware, law enforcement doesn't even have an app that will receive remote ID signals. So law enforcement officers, you know, they can't even find drones with remote ID. We've got the solution sitting there and it can't be used. So that's it for another edition of the Drone News. Remember, don't subscribe. It only encourages me. Don't click the thumbs up button because it only encourages the algorithm. And I will see you again next time. Stay tuned. More videos coming on this channel about model aircraft, drones, technology, all the cool stuff that we love to enjoy. Thanks for watching. Thanks to my Patreon supporters. Thanks to my channel members. Spot you later. Bye for now.